Welcome to our audience throughout the United States and throughout uh, the whole world. We're very honored to present to you today the International Association for Arts and Culture for Peace. Every Tuesday, we do a special program focusing mostly on the Korean Peninsula, how we can really help uh, through humanitarian aid, cultural exchange, diplomacy to open the doors for peace. I'm Dr. Michael Jenkins. I'm the International President of the Universal Peace Federation, and the IACP is part of our association group that does all kinds of efforts to be able to find experts as well as people with wonderful experience and engaging in a humanitarian way and in a way that opens doors for friendship. Uh, we believe that enemy nations can find ways to cooperate together and build a better world. And we're looking for that every day. One of the great experts that we have become very close with is Dr. Joseph Tuwerlinger and a very close friend. And we've been to Korea together on numerous occasions. He's been a very, a very important expert for us from many different angles on how to better understand the, the people of North Korea and what they're going through and how we might help. And I'm very, uh, Proud of Joe, uh, he helped, helped with the Uric or Orchestra. It was really amazing when they uh, uh, they performed and he helped with Carnegie Hall and so many things. And he's invited some very, very uh, special guests today to, to join us. So I'll turn this back over uh, to our congressional liaison for the Universal Peace Federation, uh, Mrs. Kayle Moffat. Thank you all. Thank you, Dr. Jenkins. And thank you for your leadership and making the space for this. And welcome again, everybody. Um, I know Dr. Jenkins already briefly introduced Dr. Tewilliger, but I'm going to give a little bit more of an introduction to who he is because we're so grateful for him helping to put together this exciting webinar that we're going to be covering today. Um, so Joe is a professor at Columbia University working in human medical genetics. And he has researched many projects in difficult parts of the world from Venezuela, Libya, and to various parts of Central Asia, among others. He is also an adjunct professor at Pyongyang University of Science and Technology, and has organized an exchange program between Columbia University and Kim Il-sung University in Pyongyang. As a musician, as well as a scientist, he plays regularly with the York Symphony Orchestra in New York City, which Dr. Jenkins mentioned, and they regularly perform concerts, including North Korean orchestral music in Manhattan. His brass group, the Film Harmonic Brass, was also planning to visit the DPRK and give some master classes at the Conservatory in Pyongyang prior to the travel ban. He has also been a part of several sports exchange projects with the DPRK in collaboration with retired all-star NBA, NBA star Dennis Rodman, with whom he has visited the DPRK on many occasions. And we, I mean, if that's not enough uh, to show Joe's qualifications here, we just want to give a very heartwarming welcome to Joe to kick off our program today. Welcome, Joe. Thank you. Thank you very much for the, the kind introduction. Um, you know, I look forward every week to these uh, seminar presentations from UPF. Uh, when COVID threw a wrinkle into everybody's lives around the world, you saw an opportunity and took advantage of it and you know, used Zoom technology to bring people together around the world. And I think you should be commended for it. And I'm really excited to be able to be a part of it. I, while I come here every week, what I notice is you have a really great set of speakers, most of whom are very important people in politics, in diplomacy, and in all sorts of you know, areas of, of great importance, economics and humanitarian aid. But the one group that tends to be missing from these are the people that have started their own initiatives, gone over to North Korea and gotten their feet wet, working, you know, working in the trenches over there, trying to build personal relationships. Now, at the moment, as Americans, at least, we're not allowed to do that because of this uh, travel ban on Americans going there. And the travel ban was put in place for good reasons. There's a lot of people go as tourists and end up getting in trouble you know, as they shouldn't. But it also puts a wrench into things because it prevents people like our speakers today from getting the chance to go over there and really work with them and build these sort of grassroots relationships that are the key to trust. Government may have a lot of power and a lot of ability to do things, 
But the North Koreans really have a lot of reasons not to trust the American government, just as we have a lot of reasons not to trust their government. So government to government relationships are always going to be difficult. But people can get along with each other and do things governments can't do, especially when you go in by yourself, build relationships of trust with people there. And as you build trust, you can actually start to really do some creative things. Like, for example, I was able to build an exchange program between Columbia University and Kim Il-sung University, where we were going to send scholars back and forth, you know, and, and try to you know, do some actual research projects together. We could have joint publications between Americans and North Koreans, which again is a great way to do things. Because what are the advantages? It's that, it's that sports, music, science, academics are not inherently political. And you can get to know people one-on-one -on -one and build a real strong relationship. It can be the basis for future things to happen at a higher level. Now, why is it that the people that you're gonna see today who are mostly people that have built their own arts projects in North Korea, why are they missing from the conversation? And there's two main reasons. One is that usually anytime we open our mouths, we get in trouble. Because in, in the general American audience, if you say that you've done things in North Korea or say anything that humanizes them and tries to explain that they're real people, just like you and me, with the same feelings, the same emotions, the same dreams and hopes, they immediately call you an apologist, a communist, or something like that, and say that you're a bad person or you're anti-American. And they don't really listen to it because they don't understand that just because you engage with someone doesn't mean you agree with them, right? As you all know, Reverend Moon went over and met Kim Il-sung and he certainly was never a communist. He was the opposite, but he was able to do that and build a relationship without, you know, and, and it, it, the problem for us is that we are all accused of being on the wrong side of things by popular audiences. And that's not true. I mean, I'm now in a hotel room in California on my way to the Libertarian National Convention, which is the exact opposite of communism. It's like individual freedom and all that stuff being the essence of everything. But yet I can still build a good relationship with people that have very different ideas from myself you know, about politics in North Korea and build trust on that level by showing up, being honest, speaking my truth and telling them what I think and they tell me what they think and we respect each other and don't go around being judgy, which is one of the big problems. We have. So anyway, I convinced all these people that UPF is a very different audience because I know that you all believe strongly in the benefits of engagement of people getting to know each other and build relationships you realize that it's not doing any harm to the political the political relations between our countries when regular folks go over there and make friends with them and try to do something constructive together as a group. And I think that you should be commended for that and that you should also understand that you're getting a great treat today in hearing from people who've actually gotten their feet dirty. They've actually been in North Korea many times. I think most of the panelists here are fluent in Korean um, and these are all the things that happen when you go there, you work, you build friendships. And they're going to talk to you about their experiences there from the perspective of someone who's actually done it rather than it being purely a theoretical construct. So I'd like to uh, leave it at that and not really get too much to my own uh, work in North Korea because I think we're, we're here to hear from these wonderful set of speakers that, that have agreed to be here today. And I hope that we have a nice discussion that will get going as, as this goes along. And I, I'm sure that that will happen because I know all these people personally. So let me start by introducing, let's see, who's the first speaker, I guess is Maria. So I'm gonna introduce you to Maria Yoon, who's a, a very interesting person. She does museum tours of all the big museums in New York City, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the American Museum of Natural History. And she has a lot of very uh, important people coming to hear from her. She also does them in Korean as well when necessary for, for people that come from South Korea and want to see it. And actually from North Korea as well. And that's a, a whole separate story. Um, but uh, Maria works a lot with the Metropolitan Museum of Art and tried to work in North Korea on a program of exchange where they would exhibit some things from North Korea in New York. Unfortunately, again, because of the travel ban, a lot of this stuff had to be put on hold. And now with COVID, it's obviously gonna be a while, but she's worked and she's, she's one of the few people I know who actually has had meetings with people at museums in North Korea over Skype. Everyone says they don't have internet and it's dark, but that's not true. You can always find ways of doing things. And she met with a lot of people over there and had some very unique experiences. She also is a uh, filmmaker and performance artist 
who's um, known around the world as Maria, the Korean bride, is she did a big exploration of marriage in Korean culture and how it's perceived around the world and so forth. And she's got two movies on that topic as well. So she's been a very productive person and a very unique voice. So let me turn it over now to Maria, uh, please. Thank you, Joe, and thank you um, for having us. Um, I'm so thrilled and happy to be here. Well, I mean, Matt is like my home away from home. And as you were sharing my introduction, my bio, my, I'm like dying and itching to go back to DPRK. Last time I was there was eight years ago. I had planned to go back there in year 2017. And I think travel ban was in place for those of us who is USA citizen. Um, I was interested in promoting the artists from less represented part of the world. So that was my main focal reason for visiting DPRK. I didn't realize until now, today, revisiting my notes, um, it was a lot of temples that they had shared with me. <laughs> I mean, I was representing thinking art, cultural exchange with DPRK and the Met, but that clearly did not happen. I mean, there was one in particular, I remember visiting Goryeo Museum, which is lovely, and, and, but their conservation department didn't even exist. So that really sat in me like, ah, oh, I wish we could, you know, preserve this in a better light and better condition. And then that also came along with authenticity. How do I know if this is real? Can I actually bring this, you know, back safely to New York City and share it with the world? So all of those things added on complicated the matter, but we did, they were, I mean, the Met was really interested. We had several meetings and we had already planned to bring curator over to DPRK so she could see it for herself. But but I haven't, I mean, my desire to make that happen has not stopped because I also wanted to bring live art auction from Pyongyang using VPN or whatever internet connection they may have. Because like you said, Joe, I was able to communicate with them through Skype, which felt so surreal to begin with. I thought I was dreaming. But I mean, they're equally interested too to have this cultural exchange of voices. You know, and I only then, once you're better educated, then you could you could appreciate them with less judgment. I mean, there shouldn't be any judgment, especially in the arts, but people tend to judge. And this is the part I want to be less, you know, or not exist at all. So the conversation is so important to me and that I felt like was missing. But I mean, we'll see with my connection to other entertainment lawyers who's on my side and I've sponsors waiting for this live art auction to happen. I really do, um, I'm holding on to that dream, thinking that it's going to happen sooner than I, you know, I wish that it did. Anything else? Um, no, I mean, what else? Is, I mean, yeah, the tours, you mentioned that I've given tours to many different types of people, diplomats, politicians, um, yes, occasionally in Korean. I remember I had to do, I had to go to Museum of Natural History to talk about science in Korean. And that was like, oh, Joe, <laughs> different part of the world because I'm more of an art lover versus science. But I made that happen too, because my love of art, science, or what have you, they kind of merge in between, I think. Or you might disagree as a scientist yourself. I don't know. Um, but um, I always enjoy talking about the arts and, and finding that mutual ground to communicate, right? Did I miss anything else? I don't know. <laughs> no, thank you. Thank you. That's a great introduction. Um, yeah, and I mean, at one point, even uh, Maria and I gave a tour to some North Koreans in New York City to the American Museum of Natural History, right? <laughs> That's what I was referring to, science, yeah. Korean. <laughs> <laughs> and um, they asked me many interesting questions. One in particular, I think one of them asked, we are, I mean, they had a question about the Lucy, right? Our, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> that alone was like, wow, are we connected? Are we related? I mean, I would never, never, I would never forget that moment that was very memorable to this day. Yeah, I mean, the one thing that always impressed me when I was teaching at the university in Pyongyang is actually how much the students there know about the rest of the world, about science, about art, about culture. I remember one time I was lecturing and I made a joke about football, about a touchdown. And they go, oh, seven points. And I'm like, wait, how do you know that? And they are actually very well educated, very smart, and very bright. And they asked Maria a lot of challenging questions and it was really fun to watch her sweat. <laughs> thank anyway, you. thank you very much. Um, we'll get back to you in the discussion session. Um, the next speaker is uh, Nikolai Johnson. And uh, 
I met Nikolai when uh, I was in China, living in Yenji for a summer in 2012. And we spent uh, two months there studying the North Korean language at Yenbian University with professors who had taught at Kim Il-sung University. And for an American and a European, Nikolai's from Norway, it was very difficult to find ways to learn the North Korean language, their own dialect, this just special peculiarities. And so we got to spend the summer together there and we were in the same class, but his Korean is far better than mine is. Now he's pretty well known to all the Korean American community as uh, one of the stars of South Korean shows at Bijong Sok Redam, the unusual or not normal summit. And well, he's a little bit unusual. And that's why he's a very interesting person to invite here. And he's also got his uh, colleague, uh, Carlos Garito, who is also a star of that show. And they both are, you know, TV personalities in South Korea. I know that I've had Korean American friends. They, they found out I knew Nikolai. I'm like, oh, 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 I got to meet him. I want to meet him. He's so, so famous. Oh, Nikolai is so wonderful. Because their show, they basically talk about South Korea. And Nikolai's actually talked about North Korea as well on South Korean television in Korean because their Korean is completely fluent. And I think, let me uh, turn it over to Nikolai and, uh, and Carlos, whatever, if you guys want to go together, you guys can say whatever you want and uh, introduce yourselves and the work you've done in North Korea. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you for that introduction and for having me here today, uh, having us all here today. So um, yeah, I attended, I attended university in uh, Japan and South Korea. And I had the chance to become close friends with former students of um, North Korea affiliated uh, Chongyon Korean schools in Japan. And without them, I might not have decided to visit the DPRK in the first place. Um, because these, these friends, they've gone there on school trips and on um, family visits. And they told me um, a lot about um, the country. And then, you know, they opened my mind to see past politics and mainstream uh, media narratives. Uh, by telling me about the people there and, you know, their love for, for family and, and culture. So like myself, before I met these friends, I think a lot of people around the world, they have difficulties just realizing that, um, like any other country, the DPRK is full of real humans, uh, each with indiv individual stories, um, but with core values similar uh, or the same as, as us. So um, this is not obvious to people in South Korea either. Uh, like Joe said, I've, I've talked a lot about my experiences in the DPRK on South Korean TV, and I'm often told that it's amazing to hear that despite the political differences, uh, Koreans on both sides are actually very similar. Um, so uh, on, on this TV show, Abnormal Summit, or Pijong Samudam, it was together with Carlos uh, and about uh, 10 other Korean-speaking foreigners. And every week we talked about uh, each other's cultures, trying to make uh, the cultures feel less foreign. Uh, to our Korean audience. Um, well, I think exchange with DPRK and other countries uh, is extremely important for connecting people, allowing them to see how in essence uh, we are not at all very different. And you know, sadly there's a lot of people around the world who is in favor of war, and I believe that their way of thinking is grounded in, in fear and, and prejudice, and that most would uh, change their mind if they had opportunities to experience each other's cultures um, firsthand. And since my first trip to the DPRK in 2011, uh, being able to speak Korean allowed me to communicate with a large number of Koreans who had never uh, talked to any foreigners before. And they would show me their uh, family pictures, I would show them mine. And um, I felt that, you know, all these conversations have been very meaningful to myself. And I think also to the Koreans I talked to, uh, because it's really mutually breaking down uh, prejudice and creating a true hope for, for peace. And um, for me, when initiating conversations in the DPRK, I think it helps me to uh, introduce myself as a Norwegian, because Norway you know, is not seen as intimidating at all. And uh, in North Korea, it's known for social democracy and welfare. Um, but I know from, from traveling in the DPRK with Joe and others, uh, that often just a, a genuine bright smile, it's really all it takes to make people feel at ease and remove fears of, of someone from what they're told uh, is, is the enemy country. So I think as long as the, the very unfortunate US travel ban exists, uh, international exchange, including the DPRK and the US, um, it could still be held in other countries. And I think that would be very meaningful. So um, like Joe said, I met him about 10 years ago at the North Korean language program in Yeonbyeong. 
Um, and uh, this program was initiated by a small Canadian NGO. And we studied at uh, Yambion University and went on study trips to the DPRK. Uh, and there in Yambion, we had uh, North Korean language uh, study partners. And as we became friends, these cultural differences, um, it didn't seem like barriers, but more just like mutually fascinating topics and conversation that made our time together all the more valuable. Um, afterwards, I worked with a Norwegian artist, Morten Trovik, uh, on one of his projects, bringing young musicians from the DPRK to perform in Norway. And I was guiding and interpreting for the Koreans in Norway as we traveled around, uh, also visiting Norwegian schools. And this was possible with the cooperation of the, the DPRK Committee for Cultural Relations with Foreign Countries. Um, and the Korean and the Norwegian students, they were genuinely very excited and curious about meeting and talking to each other. And after a few hours together, um, they were visibly very disappointed. The exchange was already over because they had, they had bonded uh, in a few hours. And such exchange is so important. Uh, and the more it would happen, the bigger impact uh, it would have. And um, for, a, for a time, uh, a very good friend of mine, he ran a travel company specializing in academic tours to the DPRK. So I worked as a DPRK tour leader uh, for a few years. And our tours included a three week uh, Korean language program at the Kim Hyung-jik University of Education in Pyongyang. And, and this was possible uh, working with the Korean International Youth and Children Travel Company. Um, and talking with them in North Korea, they made it very clear that it was both fully possible and desirable to bring Korean artists to basically any part in the world, um, as long as we could provide venues and, and set up programs. And at the time, we weren't able to, to find funding for, for setting up these, these venues uh, and such. But the important thing is that it's so much realistic potential for what can be done um, for exchange that can be initiated uh, by just people from a, a grassroots level. And I believe that what's most important for success is just being honest, having patience uh, and interest in building mutual trust and uh, mutual understanding. So, um, yeah, thank you for having me here today and I'm looking forward to the discussions. Yeah, thank you, Nikolai. It's uh, really great to, great to see you online here and uh, hear, hear from your experiences there. I know that, you know, we, we spend a lot of time together going around the DPRK and that You've had some very unique experiences there, shall we say. <laughs> so um, actually, uh, according to the program, I think uh, Justin is supposed to go next and then we'll get back to you, Carlos. Is that OK? All right. Okay. So uh, the next speaker is uh, Justin Martel. Now, Justin Martel is a filmmaker in um, New York, based in New York City. And um, I actually met him at a film festival in New York when they were celebrating the uh, Lifetime Achievement Award for Lloyd Kaufman, who drew, ran the studio where he was working at the time, Trauma. Um, and Justin immediately came over to me because we had a mutual friend who I'd met on my first trip to North Korea as a tourist back in the early 2000s. And um, Justin was going to talk to him about North Korea and the guy told him, so no, you got to talk to, to this other guy, meaning me. And then we met and we bonded and we've talked a lot over the years. And Justin has had the experience of going over there, working with tour companies to make videos uh, about North Korea. He's one of the few people who's been allowed to film the entire length of the Pyongyang Metro, which is something most people claim. I mean, a lot of, a lot of the... Uh, the, the fake news media says that uh, it only really has two stops on the subway and it, it's full of actors and everything. But Justin's been on the whole thing to prove it exists and actually be, was able to film it. He's also worked briefly as a, a, a tour guide in North Korea, but only I think one tour because the travel ban came into effect after he'd moved to China to, to start working on that. And he was trying to eventually bring uh, some American, you know, actually make some real films over there. He's also made feature films in Albania and in Serbia and in other parts of the world that are quite difficult. So I thought he would be a very good person to invite here. Also, because I think that, you know, I think that there's a lot of networking potential here for all the panelists as well as for the people in the audience. So let me turn it over to Justin and, you know, you can tell us about your work there, why you got interested in Korea and how it all got started. So Justin. Well, thank you, Joe, for the invitation and for having me on the panel. Um, obviously, I think, you know, a lot of what I will say will, will echo the sentiments of our, um, of our other panelists, but, you know, I had had the, you know, 
very American uh, view of North Korea uh, that I think almost kind of, I don't know, the borders like the way normal, you know, average Americans see North Korean, uh, North Korea kind of almost borders on a fetish, you know? And so when I had been at that film festival and I had seen my friend who I, he had posted on Facebook that he had been to North Korea and he said, no, you should go and talk to Joe. You know, I went up to Joe and, and you know, I said, uh, so I, I understand you, you know, the young marshal. And he said, oh, do I? And he pulled out his cell phone and uh, showed some pictures of, uh, of uh, his uh, trips with Dennis Rodman. And just based on that conversation, it, you know, just even just some of the questions that I asked, you know, Joe kind of was able to sort of turn around my way of thinking about a lot of these things. And, and to me, it had seemed like something that was like very taboo to even visit or go or engage with the DPRK. But based on that conversation, you know, and Joe said, no, you should go and you should see for yourself. You should, you know, go check it out. Um, and eventually that's what I ended up doing. I ended up going and working for a company called Young Pioneer Tours, uh, making travel videos and uh, YouTube promos for YPT. And of course I had seen the Vice style uh, documentaries that were on YouTube and were of course very popular. And I had seen you know, how the uh, filmmakers behind those documentaries had engaged their Korean counterparts. And that they were just basically would question, you know, question anything that the Koreans said to them. If the Koreans said, you know, please don't film this thing, they would obviously try to film it and created a, a scenario and an environment to get that kind of very exploitative, you know, documentary. And, um, you know, I wanted to do the exact opposite. I just said, I'm going to, I'm actually going to come, I'm going to, you know, you know, I want to actually prove them wrong about what they might think about Americans. And um, that was just kind of my approach. So, you know, when I was setting up doing my travel documentary, you know, promo stuff, doing shots, I would call my uh, Korean counterparts over and say, uh, gentlemen, uh, you know, what, how do you, what do you think about how I framed the shot of this particular statue or this building or this thing? And uh, sometimes they would give me feedback. Actually, I think you should, uh, adjust the camera in this way and, and I would do it. And, you know, because I was American, I would say that, you know, on my first trip for the first two or three days, they were kind of like always over my shoulder, like, you know, very, you know, closely watching what I was filming and what I was doing. But I found that the more I deferred to, to them and their point of view, and I, and I didn't feel like I was putting on airs or anything, it actually, you know, we, I actually got more freedom and more ability to film things that I wouldn't have otherwise been able to do. Um, and so I just, that was kind of just took the complete opposite approach of the Vice style documentaries. Um, and that ultimately culminated, as Joe said, and me being, I think, the first uh, Western, but certainly the first American videographer to film the entirety of the Pyongyang Metro. And it, we did it specifically to debunk the myth that a lot of tourists say that there's only two stops to the Pyongyang Metro and that it doesn't actually exist. And it was funny because my Korean counterparts were aware of this, uh, you know, kind of myth that's been put out there by the Western media. Um, and they were very into the idea of making a video and debunking that myth together. Um, and so that's, that's kind of the, the doors that opened. I've just found that as long as I was honest and, uh, um, you know, trusted them, the more they trusted me and the more I was able to do. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thanks for sharing yeah. your experiences there. I know that it's, you know, I guess you're hoping you'll have the chance to go back and do something more if the travel ban goes away. Like you've recently been working, I, as I understand this summer, you were in Serbia and you'd done things yes. in Australia before. Yeah, I actually did the first two um, American features that were ever shot in Albania in 2018 and 2019. And of course, uh, I'm sure that everybody here has a, a, a general you know, idea of the history of this, that Albania had a very, similar style government to the DPRK. Um, and it's uh, so it was engaging with Albania and, and sort of being able to do that, I would say, 
I used very similar uh, tactics and a very similar approach uh, with my Albanian counterparts and it worked. We were able to do accomplish some amazing things filmed at UNESCO World Heritage Sites in Albania and things that, that filmed with the Albanian Navy on the Adriatic Sea and things that I don't think would have otherwise been possible. And that I might have, if not for my experience working with the, you know, working in the DPRK, I might have gone in with a more American or arrogant attitude, which wouldn't have allowed that type of access. So that also exactly. informed my work there. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation. We can look forward to the discussion. Um, and now I'll, I'll turn this over to Carlos. Carlos uh, Garito is uh, from Brazil, and he also lives in South Korea and is a, a South Korean television personality. As I understand, you've also been to North Korea making a, uh, shooting some sort of documentary type footage or something for the South Korean broadcast network. Is that correct? I believe so. And I'm, look, we're all looking forward to hearing your story. So Carlos, please. <laughs> Um, thank you, Joe. Thanks for inviting. It's really a pleasure to be here talking to all of you. Um, yes, actually, I've been working with North Korea very recently. It's been uh, this year, maybe the fifth year. And here in South Korea, they use the word Yokchuhang, so we go all the way around. So I was basically focused only on the South. And then I realized that uh, there was no reason to see just the Southern half of the country if you also have the Northern half. I have a good friend who put a lot of influence on me <laughs> to go explore and learn more about it and see the not not have a biased idea about it. And I'm really thankful for him. And anyway, uh, let me share a little bit of the story that I have with the North. Um, when I introduce myself in Korean, I do that more often than in English. I like to say that I'm a Brazilian who loves Korea. And it's always tricky to choose which word you're going to use for Korea, right? <laughs> so now I, choose, I, I like the people of Korea because that's probably what I like the most about the peninsula and not uh, indifferent of a political system or, or the country, the modern country that we have now. Um, so I'm always trying to reduce the gap about the, the bias that we have, uh, mostly in my country, in Brazil, in Latin America, about Korea. Um, I think that uh, a lot of people around the world also have some bias about uh, Brazil and about Latin America. So I identify myself with, uh, with the Koreans. Um, I think we have that in common as well. Uh, Brazil wasn't during the Korean War. Uh, we have embassies in Pyongyang and in Seoul. Um, and I think it helps a little bit to be a country that it's a little bit like in the middle. Um, when I was in Pyongyang, I called my parents. I always remember this story because I felt so good about it. And the rates for calling Brazil from Pyongyang was super cheap. Uh, I mean, if you called a, an, uh, an European country, uh, it was super expensive, but Brazil was super cheap. Like I felt like calling my parents all the time. <laughs> and I would call my mom and talk to her from the hotel. It was was really nice, despite being probably the most uh, uh, far away countries, right? It's an antipode. Uh, if you dig a hole here in the Korean Peninsula, you come out in Brazil or Uruguay, southern Brazil. So it's very far, but in terms of communication, I felt very close. I took it as a, as a small sign of friendship between our countries. Um, I think the North is also very interested mostly in football, uh, soccer for Americans. <laughs> but uh, when I talked, uh, when I mentioned I was from Brazil, everyone was talking about Pelé, everyone was talking about football, about uh, soccer. And uh, it was uh, really an easy topic and a way to open their minds and they felt very comfortable. They had many, uh, many questions. Uh, women's football is also very strong in North Korea, like it is in the US. Um, I was pretty much interested in, in knowing what they're doing in that sense. And uh, I, I, I could talk about it very easily with basically anyone that I met there uh, in Korean. I've been Korean for a long time, so I speak Korean. Um, and uh, actually, when you arrive in North Korea, you never know which language you should use. Should I stick to English? Because, uh, you know, I don't want to show them that I live in Seoul. But uh, in the end, I just, Nikolai gave me that advice that you should just open yourself and uh, show who you really are. I, I shared pictures of my family and like just opening your heart and then you, you establish a good communication. After a long time in, in Seoul, actually in the South, as I mentioned, um, I had the chance to be on TV with Nikolai, uh, the Normal Summit, that's the name of the show. Nikolai was representing Norway, I was representing Brazil. Nikolai talked a lot about North Korea. I became interested and very curious about North Korea because of Nikolai talking about it. So 
I did the other way around. Um, and then because of that show, I, we had a lot of exposure here in the South. Uh, we got many different op opportunities of talking to a larger audience. And one specific opportunity that like opened my mind was to be a brand ambassador for Kanwon province. So Kanwon province is uh, a province here in the Northeast of uh, South Korea. And it's the only divided province in the world. It's still divided to this day. We have Kanwon province in the South and Kanwon province in the North. So I was, I was like going uh, around South Korea and in Brazil as well during the Rio Olympics um, promoting Kanwon province. But I thought to myself, which Kanwon province am I promoting, right? Should I talk about the Kanwon province of the South or the Kanwon province of the North? And then after going to the North, I realized there is no common province of the South or the North. It's exactly the same. <laughs> when you talk to someone in common province, the North, Northern side of the DMZ, they have this, the same accent. The food is the same. So we don't have to choose between Kumgansan or Soraksan or between going to the beach in, in one sun or Kunnan because they're all the same. It's, it's the same uh, province. It's the same reason, region. They feel like they are the same. They are still the same. And it was really mind opening for me to have their experience. So a few years later, um, and uh, Nikolai wasn't in Korea at that time. <laughs> Actually, I called him many times because I didn't know how to really do it. I was invited by a TV show, a TV company here, a TV station in the South. It's a big channel. I'm not going to say which one is it, but you can look online, you're going to find it. Uh, to go to the North to produce a show about tourism, about traveling to the North. And it was, uh, was a little bit, uh, I mean, I, 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 didn't, I was the only one of the crew that had experience in the North. So I was basically guiding the other guys, even though I didn't really have a lot of experience, but uh, they felt like they trusted me. Um, uh, so anyway, we, we went, we did. But the interesting thing is that nobody thought it would work. Uh, this, the, 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 the TV station, they thought we wouldn't be able to shoot anything we wouldn't come back, come back with any footage. Uh, and then in the end, we had not only one episode, but three. It was really successful. And I was the guy that was there uh, with this all non-Korean crew. There was no, no Koreans, all foreigners. I was the only one with previous experience with the North. And like, uh, hey guys, it's gonna work. Let's do this. I was very confident we would be able to do it. Actually, the main topic, the main reason for us to travel to the North was to cover, um, there was a, a match for the, quali a qualifying match for the World Cup between North Korea and South Korea. And it, it, it happened in Pyongyang. And the idea was to send us the non-Korean crew, the foreigner only, foreign, uh, Korean speaking, but all foreigners uh, crew to go to Pyongyang and to shoot the match, like to cover the match. So again, it was related to sports, something that I, I, I'm really passionate about it. We went there and in the end, we couldn't cover the match. And it was like, what do we do now, right? We have to make the show, what do we do? We were there in Pyongyang, the match was going on and we couldn't go into the station. There were many, uh, anyway, many things I, I, I don't know the details, but we couldn't. And then, all right, let's make a show. Let's just enjoy and see the, the, the have, have a good experience because we were actually having a good experience there. So we went to uh, Wonsan, uh, we went to Kungansan, we did all the tours in Pyongyang, it was wonderful. And, uh, and that's what you see in the show because we had a good time and you see it. So I was there shooting, most of the footage that went on the show was the footage that I, I, I shot. Uh, you, we got back here, it was super popular. The show got an award, uh, everyone was looking for more episodes and then COVID came, pandemic came, we couldn't do more. But the, the talk uh, changed. Now it wasn't about whether it was possible to do the show, but uh, about when we were going to do the next, uh, the next episode. So now we, were, we, we talked a lot, uh, maybe going to Mashigryong uh, Ski Resort, maybe going to Pek Sun through the Samjion Airport. What else can we shoot for tourism to promote here in the, in the South? Um, just to finalize what I had to say, uh, how we did it, uh, maybe people that are watching us, they'll be asking themselves, what made the difference? I think uh, it's just having an open mind and being confident that when you are transparent, when you are yourself, when you show a you whoop in your heart, when you show the people that you are a creation of God, just like they are, you see, they will 
communicate with you. They will build trust and, 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 and transparency, and it's going to be very uh, much easier to work with them. That's what I had to say. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Carlos. Yeah. I mean, I agree. It's, it's a, the most important thing is just don't judge people, see them as your equals and, and just re give them respect that you expect to get in return, you know? And it's so simple, yet people have a hard time doing it because the, when it comes to North Korea, we're all given a caricature to see and, and people start taking that as, as, as if they know what the truth is. It bothers me when you see a lot of people talking as experts on North Korea who've never actually been there. You know, I never actually built friendships there, or relationships there, which are very easy to do if you're honest and trustworthy. I remember, like, we went there, um, you know, I was part of Dennis Rodman's delegation, and uh, we went over there, and Dennis promised to put on a basketball game, bringing NBA stars over, and they didn't really believe it would happen. And when it actually did happen, Kim Jong-un said personally to us, he said, you know, you're the first Americans that ever kept their word. You know, because they all have this idea that they can't trust us, just like we have the idea that we can't trust them. And I think that's all based on real events. I mean, the governments have reason not to trust each other, but people can build these relationships once they find out that you're an honest person. I mean, another thing they, they said to us, they said, you know, to Dennis especially, they said, you don't always say nice things about us, but you say the same thing behind our back that you say to our face. And I think that's incredibly important. Just like with other, he said, there's a lot of people go over there and they say nice things and then they turn around as soon as they're out of the country and they say the opposite. And nobody likes someone who's two-faced and double-talking. You want it just honesty. So I always say the most important thing is to be yourself, to go over there, talk, and you can pretty much get anything done you want if you build a relationship. Another thing you said that really resonated with me, and I think Maria alleged, and maybe we should start the discussion and bring all the the panelists in now, since that's the the, the last of the um, individual speakers. Um, one thing you said that I think is a very important thing that everybody needs to have in mind if you're planning any engagement projects with North Korea is that you can have everything planned out perfectly. You go there and all of a sudden they say, nope, you're not going to do that. And you have to be very adaptable and very relaxed and be ready to change your plans and understand that you're going to get done what they want you to get done. And you have to find a way to make that also what you want to get done. You have to find a way that everybody gets something out of it, but you can't expect that just because you got something on paper means that it's going to happen. Is that, would any of you have comments on that about that, Maria or Carlos, Nikolai or Justin? Listen, I wanted to see more art institutions that take, they took me to so many mausoleums and then temples. And I was just like, museums, galleries, museums, artists, studios, that didn't have to happen often enough. So I just gave up and went with the flow. You know, my intentions, I had to remind them every day. And I'm like, hey, I wanna see ancient civilizations, art from the ancient civilizations. I wanna meet these artists, you know, share with me. So it was really interesting, but I mean, I think I was the only American traveling at the time. So it was, it was, it was wild. And there were other mega buses with the European tourists. And then there was me alone there. So that whole process was interesting absorbed. But once I spoke Korean with them, they're like, oh, Miss Yoon, you can walk around, do your thing. You want a videotape? Go videotape. And I was like, what? Now you're telling me this? I wish I brought my professional camera like Justin would have used. <laughs> now you're telling me this? I only have my iPhone? It yeah, was I, I mean, I always found like, you know, because I have certain connections in North Korea and everybody knows about that when I teach there they give me complete freedom kind of so I can walk around Pyongyang I can do what I, I, I want to do and the fact is that when they give you freedom most people then take advantage of it to try to do what they're not supposed to do and I always found that I when I was on my own and not under the obvious view of anybody I know there were people watching I went out of my way to exaggerate following the rules you know, and went to the extreme opposite direction because I know that they, they give you rope to hang yourself with. And if instead you tie a nice knot and do something nice with the rope, then they give you even more trust and you have the chance to do even more. And when you build that trust, you can pretty much do anything. I mean, the reason I went initially with Dennis Rodman to North Korea is because I knew that this would be a useful way to build trust and build a relationship. And then all of a sudden they allowed me to do my academic exchange program between the universities because I built the trust 
by my actions, by not taking advantage of opportunities and sort of, you know, going with the flow, you know, and trying to make the best of things. Um, and it's like what you said, Carlos, I think, right? You know, when you had to change your project entirely at the last minute, yeah? Yeah, I mean, you have to be flexible and you have to be reasonable and respectful. Mm -hmm. I mean, things you wouldn't do in your country, the type of attitude, uh, the type mm -hmm. of facility, you, would, you wouldn't be allowed to shoot in your country. You won't be allowed to shoot in North Korea. That's obvious. Mm -hmm. You don't have to ask yourself. You just, you just do what is reasonable, mm -hmm. you know? If you have and, that, and treat them like normal people. Yeah, I mean, you are in a normal country. If you act like you are in a normal country, like you are in your country, most mm -hmm. of the things you're going to do exactly the same. Um, we couldn't shoot the match, but we could shoot uh, maybe more interesting footage. We mm -hmm. had the opportunity to talk to a lot of people. Uh, we had the opportunity to, to go like mostly everywhere. And I really couldn't remember a moment that they told me to turn off the camera. Mm -hmm. I was reasonable, of course. Yeah. But that's why I didn't get it. And the moment that they, they noticed that they didn't have to tell me every each time that they'll oh, turn off the camera, turn off, don't, don't take pictures, you know, mm -hmm. and they trust you. They okay, so this guy know what he's doing. We, yeah. I, we don't really have to worry about him. It, it's gonna be fine, you yeah. see. And then it works for everyone. Because imagine if the guides they have to tell that to you all the time. That, mm -hmm. that, that's so tiring. I mean, you need to build a relationship. In the end, you want to be friends with them. And that's what we became, right? Every time that we go, we become friends with the guys because we spend so much time with them. So, I mean, you don't want to bother them for something that is not important. And that's, I mean, you wouldn't do in your country, right? Yeah. And, uh, and anyway, that, that's it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's yeah. also to have to remember that when you go to somebody else's house and they tell you to take off your shoes before you enter the house, you take off your shoes before you enter the house. You, you go to someone's house, you live by their rules, whether or not you agree with them. You don't have to agree with them to follow them. Yeah? It's just being respectful and, and understanding you know, that, look, we may not agree with them about what they believe about things, but it's very important to understand what they believe so that you can show respect for that. Yeah, It's just yeah. like with people, I mean, the UPF is dedicated to interfaith relations where they bring people who are Muslims, Christians, Jews, and all different religions together to get along with each other. And I'm sorry, there's nothing more fundamentally different than your belief about the Almighty and what the truth is of reality. And yet they're able to get those people to talk to each other. Political differences are trivial by comparison. So it's just like, if, if we can show respect for their political system, they show respect for our beliefs. I never push on them what I believe, but if they ask a question, I answer it honestly, you know, and I think that's what you would do with anybody, right? I think we Absolutely. agree way more than we disagree, and that's what we yeah. should focus on. Yeah. yeah. My, my approach was just always, I found that a lot of people visiting DPRK, either as documentarians, filmmakers, or even as tourists, would never give the Koreans the benefit of the doubt. And that's the way I would codify it down into what is that I would, I, in most cases, was my policy to give them the benefit of the doubt. And I found that that actually, you know, opened things up because it was like, you know, you could be driving down the road, some on the highway, somewhere between Pyongyang and Wonsan. And, uh, you know, a tourist would ask our Korean guide, oh, what is that, this random building on the side of the road? And, you know, of course, the Korean guy might not know what that building is, you know, and, <laughs> and it's just, and it's just like, I don't know. And then they, you know, tourists would turn to the other tourists and, you know, see, like, it's all, it's all fake. You know, he did, you know, they didn't know what that building was. And it's like, you know, that's, that's, that was my approach is like, you know, of course, I'm not going to expect my guides to know what's the, this random, like, building or shack is on the like driving down the highway and if they don't know it doesn't mean that you've uncovered some sort of truth or you know some like conspiracy that's happening behind the curtain or behind the scenes and that sort of informed my approach yeah it's like if, if somebody comes to visit new york i'm not going to take him to the ghetto i'm right. going to the met you know i'm going to take yes. him Museum of Natural History to see the World Trade Center. I'm not going to show them the underbelly of New York. In fact, I try to protect them from it right. because right now it's not particularly safe. You know, um, yeah, right? And and you don't and you don't know what every building is in New York. Of course you know? not. Yeah. yeah. 
And I'm certainly not encouraging them to take pictures of the worst aspects of New York because I'm proud of it. It's my hometown. I want to show it off in a positive light. And I think that's a normal human reaction. And you got to remember, they're normal humans. They're not monsters. They're normal. They're just like you and me. Yeah? I mean, Nikolai, you've probably spent as much time there as anybody. I know that, you know, I, I've certainly yeah. seen how you interact with them. I mean, when we went to North Korea, we would go to the beach for language practice and just talk to normal people who are out there on vacation. We'd go to the park. And Nikolai, of course, his Korean is, was the best of anybody in the group. And he would just go over and engage with them and start dancing with random people at, on the beach and engaging. So, I mean, just, I mean, you might want to say something about your experience with real people there. <laughs> yeah, no, that was, that was great. Um, we've just the beach, the beach is one of those places where I always end up just talking and talking to, to lots of people because they're, you know, they're very curious. They ask me a lot of questions and I, I have fun just uh, talking with them. Another place is, is the zoo. The zoo is great because you just talk about the animals and, and they're, you know, you, you make this friends in, in, in one second, just commenting on what the monkey is doing. And you know, <laughs> <laughs> this, this meetings are great. And, uh, yeah, like um, like um, Justin was saying before, it, it really depends also on, on on what you're what you're looking for. Because my experience leading different types of tourists there, there's the tour always depended on what type of people were on the tour. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you would have um, tourists who were sort of trying to look for you know the the errors in the facade sort of, and they would they would ask questions like you know, okay, but what about the real story behind? And, and as soon as, as people start with this attitude, looking for, for something negative, um, if you look hard, you'll find negative things, of course, and, and the people around you will notice that's what you're looking for. And then all the doors close and you can't do anything interesting. Um, but when you have people who just are curious and who are open-minded to see, you know, what, what is possible and, and, and go with that, then, so much more opportunities arise and, and that's when you have the chance to go to the beach and um, sing karaoke and, and dance with people. Yeah. I mean, I would also I'd like just a, a brief story about what happened to me as I, I was at uh, Mashing Young, actually before it opened, we went uh, with uh, the basketball players and um, that's the ski resort that's near Wonsan. And uh, so we're up there and they had these tire tubes that we could go down the mountain on. And so I, I went down a tire tube with uh, Charles Smith from the New York Knicks. So, you know, I grew up watching, you know, and uh, so I thought this is great. You know, the problem was they didn't really have any protective barriers to prevent me from going off a 500 foot cliff at the bottom of the hill. And so I didn't realize it was there and I'm just going mindlessly down. And I suddenly realized that I was kind of fat and I got stuck in the tire tube. So I was going to head like at top speed off a 500 foot cliff. And we all know the media stories would have been Kim Jong-un kills American. You know, it wouldn't have been stupid American doesn't know how to ride a tire tube and flies off a cliff. So what happened? There were six young, small North Korean ski pros that saw what was happening and they each used their bodies, dove in front of this tire tube carrying a 250 pound man at high speed. And they went flying through the air. I've got, I actually have video of this because we had a film crew with us. And, uh, these guys all, I mean, two of them ended up in the hospital, but they saved my life. I missed going off the cliff by like 10 feet. And I was completely unaware of it. And um, they all got medals from uh, Kim Jong-un the next day as like international hero for saving his uh, Chingun Han Chingu, <laughs> which is uh, his personal friend, which was hilarious. But I mean, they, they saw that what was happening and they put their lives on the line to protect me. That's a very human thing to do, right? So I think that it's, it's just, it's the same everywhere. You know, if you treat people with respect, the doors open. If you treat them with disrespect, the doors close. And I think this is something everyone needs to understand. And when people get in trouble in North Korea, it's usually because of some human disrespect. So you'd say something that you would never say to a normal person. You would never say those things to an American that people say to a North Korean because we see them as other rather than as just being the same as ourselves. One other thing that I think is important on this topic is you know, when I was studying North Korean dialect, I bought a North Korean computer. It had all their textbooks on it from kindergarten through high school. And I read all of them. Um, and that's how I got a really good education about North Korea. They have these textbooks called Dodo, uh, which is socialist ethics. And you think, okay, well, this is going to be propaganda. And you read it and all of a sudden you realize, wait a minute, 
these are kind of the same stories that I read in Sunday school in America, except without the, the supernatural part. It was just sort of like, oh, this person's in trouble. So you help them out or you do things that are nice to each other and try to protect each other. And I, I think that people think that they're so different because they're missing out on religion, if you will. But they're getting the same teachings, the same moral values are being instilled through these other classes through a different mechanism. And I found that it's remarkable how similar the morals and the values are there as they are among people in the West, in South Korea in particular. You know, UPF always talks about universal values, and I don't think you should leave out North Korea just because they don't have a religious component to it. They're still taught the same values. They're instilled in a different way, but it's very similar. I, I mean, that was my observation. I mean, anyone have a comment on that? Nothing I mean, other than that's a great point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, um, just talk, talking uh, to North Koreans, it's, it's friends and family is oh, it's what comes up all the time. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, just even talking to um, North Korean, um, people I've, I've met, I realize that, you know, um, it feels like, you know, I, I should value my friends because of the way they talk about their friends. Their friends are someone, you know, they, they would go like, you know, of course I would do anything for my friend. If my friend is in trouble, you know, mm -hmm. I would drop everything I have. I will, you know, do anything I can to help because we are, we're friends, that's what friends do. And, you know, I've been moved by, how passionate they are um, talking about these things and, and they feel the same about their families. I would say it's one thing, if you think about communism, it comes from community and they really have a bigger sense of community than we do. If I'm looking for something that I learned from exposing myself to the opposite kind of society from what I think is ideal, which is one where the individual is important, they actually care about each other. And do things. They actually spend a lot of effort trying to protect each other too. It's like, you know, you have to do these criticism sessions, but everybody's always looking for, like, for example, when I would teach there, there'd be a student who clearly cheated, right? And everyone knew they cheated and everyone knew who it was. I'd ask who did this and what was going on and all of the other people would volunteer that they had done it because it's a system that works by protecting each other from the excesses of the system, which I think is a very sort of, you know, it's a friend thing, a looking out for each other thing. And I think that that's also what a lot of defectors say they miss the most when they leave North Korea, is that there's not the sense of community in the South. And I think Nikolai, you've had some experience with that, talking to people, right? Where they say they miss, you know, they miss the sort of sense of community back home. That's, yeah, that's, what's, that's what people say in, in the South all the time. You know, you hear, you hear stories about uh, people who come from the North to the South and, and they say, um, you know that they want to go back and it's very hard for people um, out from the outside to understand why would someone want to go back to somewhere where you have less freedom um, but what they say the reasons for that is um, you know in in other places you don't like like in Seoul I don't know who my neighbor is I don't know their names I, I don't know the birthday of my neighbor but in North Korea you know you know when your neighbor's birthday is coming up and you're you know thinking about what kind of, you know, uh, party you should have in the neighborhood. And that sense of community uh, is, is very strong in the North. It's, um, I think it's, it's a traditional sense of, of community, which is, is very valuable. And it's, um, it makes people appreciate each other in a way that um, like people living in big cities in the West might forget about. Yeah, I mean, as a geneticist, I mean, you look back in human history, we go back 10, 15,000 years ago, we were a tribal species where everybody knew everybody. They lived in a group together. Everyone knew where they fit in the system and they all, you know, made it all work. And it was, we're a very social species. And today, like you're living in New York, it's the same thing. It's like, I don't, urban life is that natural. That's why half the people in New York, some sort of, you know, mental therapy, you know, because it's not a normal, in a, not normal for human beings in a sense, urban life is abnormal and the north koreans i think less of issue with that than that's one of the things that i noticed there as well um so what were you you looked like you were going to say something justin so please chime in oh no i was just going to say you were talking about just the bigger sense of community that exists mm -hmm. in, in dprk and i've i've noticed it as well and that's you know 
I think I've actually faced more criticism from Americans being associated mm -hmm. with DPRK and it then I actually got from North Koreans for being American. Mm -hmm. um, but in the way that I generally redirect the discussion when we're talking about when we're talking about North Korea with somebody who an American or a Westerner who hasn't been there, as I say, I say, all right, listen, there's plenty that we could perhaps criticize, but let us, you know, let us redirect and let's actually talk about some of the things that the DPRK gets right. And that bigger sense of community is is one of those things that I usually talk about in those conversations. Yeah, I always remember just, you know, Dennis Craig, he's a commentator. In the media. He has often said that there's two fundamental drivers. One is for freedom, the other is to be taken care of. And uh, in like in the West, we emphasize freedom in North Korea to the extent they have the resources to do so, they emphasize taking care of people. And I, I often think of it as kind of like when children become adults, 18 or 20, there's the ones who want to get out there and be on their own from control as fast as they can. And then there's the ones that want to stay in mom's base, you know, because it's safe, it's controlled, and it's, 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 it's you're taken care of completely. And I think all the different societies in the world balance, like Norway, social democratic, so it's somewhere in the middle. There's some basic taken care of by the society, but you still have a lot of freedom as much economic freedom as you might in America or South Korea, but just more community side. And I think North and South Korea often reminds me of, you know, Korea is kind of like someone who's been the victim of domestic violence in a way, because all their neighbors abuse them over the years with China, Japan, Russia, and they feel like they're surrounded. And so they don't trust anybody. And that's North and South Korea. And they sort of evolved into this system where they went to the opposite extremes of the freedom versus taken care of the polar spectrum. And so, uh, you know, the truth is probably the ideal is somewhere in the middle between what I think is ideal and what they think is ideal. And uh, I just think that's an interesting point to think about that humans want both. They want freedom and they want someone to take care of them. And we're seeing that in American domestic politics right now. You know, there's a big difference between the left and the right. Maria, do you have something you'd like to add to the conversation at this point? I know, I was just- You've been quiet. You've been unusually quiet. Well, I was <laughs> anyway. I was channeling um Mulengmyeon because um that was another way to you know communal way of eating, doing things together. That's very much Korean lifestyle, right? Either it be DPRK or South. So um that was one thing it resonated with me. Um, they didn't charge me for the Mulengmyeon, so I was like, oh, you have to charge me extra. And it was only $5 difference. So I was like, oh, here's 20. I want to have four Nebulengmyeon for my driver and my two other guys. So it was just like such a strange, bizarre moment at that time. Because again, I was the only American traveling. So that is one thing I was thinking about as Nikolai was saying, the beach is where you you know connect with the people. For me, it was Mulengmyeon and the brewery. Because <laughs> they had just open brewery in Pyongyang. But I spent more time in Gaesong than Pyongyang. So I guess that's the difference. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's like the relationships you build there determine what you're going to have. Like, like Carlos said about building a relationship with the guides. I mean, I remember the, the second time I went to North Korea, I went as a tourist alone. And I had two weeks alone with the guides in my, in my car. We just drove all around the country. And, you know, we spoke mostly in, in, in Korean to the extent I was able to. And because one of the guides was a Japanese speaker, he didn't speak English. And the other guy was mainly German speaker. He spoke some English. And I mean... At the beginning, they're like, I was like, well, you know, we're people, we're not government, so you don't have to hate because no, we, there's no grassroots love for us. You all hate us. And it took uh, like two weeks of just talking and being honest and being friendly. And by the end of it, everything changed. You know, it's like, it's like all of a sudden we built a real relationship. And I saw him again several years later. And he mentioned, he goes, yeah, I know every time you come to the country and I always look for what's going on with you. And he said, I'm finally glad to meet. And so, you know, now it's like every time I go there, I have so many friends and they all they all know when we're there. And so they arrange accidental encounters where they accidentally run into you at this museum or accidentally run into you at this hotel just so they can say hi and catch up because you really do build real relationships over time. And I think people need to understand that they're not automaton robots that are just marching and, you know, 
and, and thinking that all Americans are evil. They're just normal people. And they're actually, what attracts, I think, most of us to North Korea is how kind and sweet they are. Because in a way, if you think about it, they're always kind of in a way like children because the state is seen as their parents. And so they don't really have the same level of personal responsibility that we do for their outcome in life. It's sort of determined. So they're much more relaxed and laid back and they don't have the stress. You know, South Koreans call Korea what? Hell Chosun, right? You know, it's like because it's a hell Korea because the stress is so high and you all are pushed to conform. They're more conformist in South Korea than North Korea because the women get these plastic surgeries to all look the same and they all have the checklist of what you're supposed to do to be happy and successful. And I know Maria doesn't like that at all. She did a movie about it, but it's the certainly the truth. And in North Korea, it's 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 a lot more laid back and relaxed and people just because there's no stress. If and you I'm do a right. really good job and work hard, you can get in trouble. But if you just do what you have to do to get by, you're going to be OK. You're going to have a good life. And, you know, then you can worry about what's important, which is your family. And to every North Korean I met, all they care about is their family. It's like my kids misbehaving. How do I get my kid in line? It's the same conversation I'd have with an American. Once you know them and get past the initial that you're a foreigner, you become actual real friends. And it is possible to have real friends, right, guys? True. <laughs> oh, true. My tour guide couldn't stop talking about his his wife the entire time. Mm. It was and, admirable. Uh, it, was, it was lovely. <laughs> Actually, Joe, we have a question from the audience, and I think for Justin, how many Pyongyang metro stops are there? <laughs> There are, there are 16 uh, stops on the Pyongyang Metro. I was going to say over 10, so I was close. Yeah, yeah. there are 16 stops, yeah. And the, the video is on YouTube under the title, Is the Pyongyang Metro Real or Fake? You decide. If you want to <laughs> I remember one time I my guide because we actually needed transportation, and they would just out because they're like oh wait wait you have a foreigner you're not supposed to be here right now you're not registered blah 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 he just goes I ah, just let him in he's okay he knows the marshal you know and then eventually they let me in and then we just went down and took a ride and there we go you know? amazing <laughs> Carlos do you have something Dad? you look like you wanted to chime in yeah um it's interesting if you think the other way around every time that we meet our guides it's like a window to the world for them because 90% of the tourists that go to DPRK are from China. So uh, they don't have as many chances to meet Westerns as they have to meet Chinese. So sometimes they want to change. They want to talk to different people. They want to exchange different ideas. When they meet us, it's an opportunity for them to ask questions about anything. So one question that I got very often was about English education. Uh, if anyone is familiar with South Korea, they invest a lot in English education, learning English, all the parents are worried about it, all the moms are talking about it, they put a lot of money into that. And in North Korea, um, with the guys, but also with other parents that I had the chance to talk to, they were always asking me, hey Carlos, you're not a native speaker of English, how did you learn English? I need, I need some help, my, my kid is not working hard. So it was very interesting. It all, it all comes back to family, to education, to, I mean, universal values, and especially here in, in Korea, right? Things that we were talking in the South, we were also talking in the North. Yeah, I mean, with English, what I'm always amazed at is, you know, I teach at Pyongyang University of Technology, right? When we're there, we live on campus with the students, we feed ourselves together. They sound like they're from Los Angeles. Their English is so much better than South Koreans. And I don't know how, because they don't watch American. Movie, don't listen to American TV, don't listen to American music, but they're really, really, really good at English. And they're also very interesting. It's like when you live there and you become friends with the students, and I back and I remember one time they, they always asked me if I finally got married. And unfortunately, I haven't met a woman who put up with me yet. But um, I, I go there and the two students we get in a and the woman said, Oh, you must get married, you must send your DNA to your next generation. <laughs> And the other one's like, no, 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 he has the freedom. I, I, I'm with Dr. Joe, Professor Joe. And they would get in a violent argument about this. And it was really funny to watch all the difference of opinion, which is just like anywhere else in the world, you know? And I remember one time, one of the kids said to me, he goes, wow, you're the luckiest man in the world because you got to meet the leader. And I said, wait, but I thought, aren't, but are, I'm luckiest, but you're Korean. I go, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm the luckiest because I get to live in Korea. But <laughs> <laughs> it's really interesting when you build these relationships based on trust. 
Unless so, um, does anyone have any, any final words to wrap up here because they're asking us to, you know. Oh, okay. But Joe, I just want to say they're still, DPRK, North Korea, they're still waiting for me to go back and officially get married there again. Oh. The marriage exploration my performance art is very important to me. Yeah, Ma Ma Maria's gotten married in all 50 states as a documentary. Sure, investigate what love means for the people, but America. But um, yeah, so stay tuned. You never know. <laughs> Um, would any of you like to say a couple words just to wrap up here? Because we want us to, you know, because we're a little bit over time anyway. It's been a great discussion, and I mean, we could go on all day, but you know, we'll we'll, we'll have to leave them wanting more. So maybe they'll invite some of you back again at some point to get into more detail about the work you've actually done there and how this is all really useful for building peace. If I were to say anything else, yes, it would it would be defying the uh, the suggestion that we should leave them wanting more. So. <laughs> but uh, thank you very much for the invitation. And um, Maria, it was very nice to uh, finally talk to you directly and very nice to meet you, uh, Carlos and uh, Nikolai. Thank you. Likewise, thank you. Yeah, the same. Thank you. It was wonderful. Thank you so much. I just want to thank all of you. This was a fantastic session. I don't know if you're reading the chat, but I'm also getting other messages. Uh, you all brought such a fresh perspective to this topic. And it was so engaging. So I just want to say you know, a personal thank you. Um, I know Dr. Jenkins is trying to join also to say thank you. So yeah, we, we look forward to continuing to hearing from all of you with your great stories and suggestions and advice. So thank you, everybody. Dr. Jenkins, did you want to say anything? I know he's, 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 he's muted. He's muted, Dr. Jenkins. Muted, Dr. Jenkins. Yeah. Wonderful, wonderful program and you're all invited back. We'd like to go into the phase two to hear more about what you've done. Thank you so much for opening our eyes to the uh, real people of North Korea. Thank you. Right, yeah. Hey, Joe, before you go, they want to find you, Mrs. Wife. Mrs. <laughs> Joe, Dr. Joe. <laughs> We'll have a special session for that at another time. <laughs> I'll be the moderator for that one. <laughs> <That's good. laughs> All right. Thank you, everybody, so much. We'll be in touch, and we look forward to the next time. Everybody take care. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Bye. you. Thank you very much. Thank you.